museum and I found this book, like it's this big, it's like literally weighs 60 pounds. And the book is called The Cody's Atlantico, it cost a freaking fortune. And I bought it and had it mailed back, right? And inside this book, uh, you know, it's all Da Vinci's notes. And the, the, the like 1,200 or so pages, but it's on parchment paper and it's got explanations for each page. I mean, it's a lot of work that Da Vinci did. And so I found this one letter that is never referenced anywhere or very seldomly referenced. And I even read the, the autobiography, um, or rather the biography by, um, by Walter Isaacson on Da Vinci's life. And there were four years of Da Vinci's life that were missing from history, 1482 to 1486. And um, so I was really trying to find out where he went during that time. And there was one obscure reference I found on the internet saying, what is this thing that Da Vinci went into this cave? And, you know, he, he like faced his shadow in this cave type of thing. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So let me see if I can find that. Well, I find this letter inside this Codice Atlantico that is written as a draft letter. And it's titled to the Devit Dar of the Sultan of Cairo, Babylon. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Da Vinci's writing a letter to somebody that's working for the Sultan of Cairo. And, uh, and the historians believe that it's all fiction. Why would he write a draft letter in fiction? Doesn't really make sense. So I started digging deeper into it. Now the ancient name of the Giza Plateau is, is Ross Tau, the Rose Tau, right? Tau is in the Greek letter. And, and Taurus, the bull, right? in Greek is Tauros, T-A-U-R-O-S. And so literally, Ross Tau is backwards, and that's where the word Rosicrucian comes from because Tau is a reference, it's the letter T, it's also a reference to a cross, right? So Rose Cross, Rosicrucian, right? Now, Da Vinci was a Rosicrucian as well. He's, you go on the AMORC website for Rosicrucians, for Rosicrucians, you'll find that they have reference to Da Vinci right on there. They're like, they claim him as their one of their, you know, Renaissance founders. And, and so I was like, okay, this is interesting. So I'm looking at this letter now to this debit bar. And what I find is that he gives a very detailed account of his travel and sojourn to Egypt. And then he says, and then we finally arrived in Egypt. We finally arrived in Cairo. And I'm like, what the... This is not anywhere in any other books about Da Vinci, and it's right here in a letter undisputed to be written by his hand. So clearly Da Vinci went to Egypt. So my mind is racing now, right? Because this is just over Christmas. Mm. And, and I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. So I start reading the rest. And in this letter, he describes his survey that he had conducted on this project for the Sultan of Cairo. And the, the Sultan of Cairo at that time was a fellow by the name of Kate Bey. Uh, he's a famous philosopher king of the Mamluk sultans, okay, who were these bodyguard class of people that got control of their country. And this guy turned out to be a philosopher king of bodyguards, I guess. And that's the word they use. Bodyguards is what Mamluk means. And they fought against the Ottomans, right, the Ottoman Empire. And so I'm, like, following all this stuff, and, and he tells this whole story about going – and surveying the mountains that he referred to as the Taurus Mountains. The Taurus Mountains. In fact, he refers to it as the Taurus Mountain. So the Bull Mountain. And he says in his description that the Taurus Mountain is as high as it, as it touches the sky, that there are three peaks of this Taurus Mountain, that it is white and glimmering limestone, and that it has exactly orientation pointing due north because he actually describes and says that on one side of the pyramid from you know uh, daytime up until noon it has sides so that means the only way that can happen on the east and west side is if it's pointed due north right and so and he's talking about the shadow and how far the shadow is cast it's like lots of detail then he goes into detail talking about the cavern inside this Taurus Mountain, which by now I'm looking at this saying, this is clearly an encryption for Rostow Mountain, which is the Bull Mountain because the entryway into the, into the, uh, into the Great Pyramid is the Apis 
chevrons, right? The upper chevrons are the representation of the bull, of the cow. And so I'm, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting, right? And I knew that the, the Apis bull is represented by the letter A. And I knew also that the Hathor in Egyptian myth is represented by the Omega. Because if you see the Egyptian Hathor myth pictures, you'll see Hathor has hair that's shaped like the Omega, right? Literally shaped like the Omega symbol. And, and, and so I'm finding all these references. And then I look at the Last Supper by Da Vinci. And I noticed that the dimensions of the room of the Last Supper match perfectly the dimensions of the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid. And I'm like, whoa. And there's an altar right in front of the table that everyone's always been, what is that thing, right, at the Last Supper? And when you overlay the picture of the King's Chamber on top of that and match the walls and everything to it, the sarcophagus lands right in the center of that. So I'm like, whoa, that's really unbelievable. Then I noticed that in the Last Supper, there's like a bull and a cow painted into the wall, right? I noticed an eye of Ra on the back. And literally, this is all unfolding. I'm posting all this stuff while I'm in Egypt with a group of 50 people. And I'm posting it all of it real time as I'm getting it, like literally within minutes of getting it. Okay, you know, what do you guys see? And I'm asking people to help me. Do you see something more in this? And it was really cool watching the crowdsourcing of sort of decrypting this mystery, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I did see. Uh, I saw some of those posts actually, and I did see some of the the comments and people really getting into it. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah, and so so then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if if we can see this stuff now and use this as a cipher for the king's chamber, what can we find when we get in the king's chamber? Well, guess what? The right wall. That we uh, that we were in the king's chamber when you're looking at the back wall and you got the sarcophagus in front of you, has a seven and a half foot stone relief of a cow, Hathor, and the apis bull that sacrificed itself within it, which represents the merger of masculine and feminine, and represents the merger of the heart brain. Mm -hmm. And it is represented by the alpha omega on the rim of the sarcophagus. In fact, I think I have this video. I can even show it to you if you guys yeah, can sure. see it. Let's see if I can find this here. First of all, here's the picture of uh, the wall. And here is the Hathor. Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Here's the Hathor, and you can see the eye, right, of this cow right here. And this is its horn. It's like a uh, profile. Now, granted, this is probably at least, I believe, 13,000 years old. Mm -hmm. if not more, okay? So you could see the head, the bull's head. Then you could see the apis bull, the male bull, inside the Hathor, where you could see the horns right here. This is the head, right? Comes down to its legs, comes uh, down here in the back, and it's even got a tail right here, comes across, and it's all encompassed within this very large Hathor. And there's even writing on the wall up here that you can see very faintly. And it looks like something between Hebrew and Urdu. And we're trying to get this analyzed right now. But I can probably show you this video. Now, this is a picture of the Alpha Omega on the rim of the sarcophagus. Mm -hmm. It had never been seen by anyone before. Right here. Yeah. You see it? So now, do you think these things had been just withered by time, or do you think that they've actually been tampered with by people? I, you know, obviously, uh, we looked at the notion that maybe it's like graffiti or something, but these are so old that, first of all, I, I don't see how it could be graffiti. First, this, this relief of the cow and the bull, it's just never been seen because people weren't looking for it that way. I was looking for it to match it up against the, you know, the, the, the Last Supper, and my wife is the one who actually found it not me. I was busy working on the sarcophagus. But um, actually, here's the video. Let's see if we can play this. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, we just found something else here in the King's Chamber.
and then we realized that, you know, it, there was actually a larger cow around it because she hadn't even seen that yet. And you can see the eye right here. Mm -hmm. It matched exactly what was on the right wall of the Last Supper. It was astounding. And, and, and so, you know, it's almost as if the texture of this is also burned. It's like it's burned into the wall. Yeah. The texture is very subtle. It, it reminds me of, I don't know if you've seen the picture of the Flower of Life in Abydos, uh, which is burned into the Assyrian temple up high on one of the columns. Mm -hmm. And it's like that. And that's what it feels like. So that night, using this kind of da Vinci uh, <laughs> encryption of the Last Supper, we were able to find literally eight new reliefs inside the Great Pyramid. Now, this here is where we saw the cow. So there's a cow. You see the horns. I'm going to trace it with my, uh, with mm -hmm. my hand. And you can see the head of the cow and the eyes. And then these are the nostrils right here. And then the ridge of the back of the cow going along here. So it's a very clearly defined ridge right along this. But of course, it's subtle because it's encrypted, right? It's yeah. supposed to be subtle. And then we started noticing here as well this Eye of Ra. And we found the Eye of Ra also in the exact same location on the back wall in the Great Pyramid. Now, da Vinci had reference going into this cavern and describing it literally perfectly to the way that it is. You know, he even says that he had to crouch down and put his hand on one of his knees and wobble back and forth to get in because there's about a 20 foot passageway you've got to go through to get into the king's chamber where it's only 38 inches high, 39 inches high. So it's like that's the, the, the height of a bar, right? So you're kind of like hunched over going back and forth to get inside uh, the king's chamber. And you know, when you look at this picture, you can see the eye, it's shaped like uh, it's got a, an, an iris, but it also has a slit for a pupil to pointing to the fact that it, it's more like a lion or a cat. And then it's got eyelashes here that he even drew on the, uh, on the pediment, right? And, and of course, the iris is also off center. It's not at the center of the window, which is what you would think if it's a window pediment. And rather, it's on the center right above the eye of Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? And Jesus represents the sun or Ra. And this is the eye of Ra. Now, what we found is that there's so much more writing on this back wall that nobody's ever seen. We're seeing numbers here as well. Um, you can see the letter A right here, mm -hmm. right? You can see ER right above it, right here. All of these things are, that you see are actually all writing. I don't know how good the resolution is uh, for you because, you know, it's not as good. When I, I, can see, I can see it pretty clearly, yeah. 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 Uh, you can even trace the back of a profile of a lion, which we believe represents the Sphinx right here. So this mm -hmm. is the mane of the lion. This is the nose of the lion. This is its back. We find also tons of other letters, the letter A showing up right here. And when you start looking at the distances, so from, from this side of, of Mary Magdalene to here, versus this distance from here to here, 